<laughs> it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker for today, uh, Paolo Lainwright, uh, who is one of our own, based at the Grantham Institute, uh, and our researchers on topics around exploring climate change related risk uh, for populations whose livelihoods are strongly dependent on seasonal rainfall, predominantly focused in Africa. She completes her PhD at the University of Reading, during which she developed a methodology for quantifying the seasonal cycle and analyzed future projections for changing precipitation seasonality of Africa. Since then, she has worked on a range of projects, including research on rainfall seasonality, including recent trends and model representation over East Africa, sub-seasonal to seasonal forecasting over Western, East and West Africa, and changing climate suitability for cocoa growth over Africa and South America in collaboration with Mars Ringley Confectionery. Um, previously, she completed a BSc in Mathematics uh, with Geography at the University of Exeter and an MSc in Atmosphere, Ocean, Climate and Reddit. Caroline, today, we will be speaking about season and rainfall over East Africa and the tropics, which have key societal importance for agriculture, health and energy. My pleasure, Yeah, I'm over to you. And I will uh, share your... Okay, cool, thank you. Um, so as Patrick said, today I'm going to be talking about seasonal rainfall over East Africa and over the tropics more broadly. I'm going to talk about some recent variability, some recent trends. I'm going to talk about climate models and I'm going to talk about future projections. So, quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be starting off by talking about seasonal rainfall over the tropics, how different parts of the tropics have different seasonal cycles of rainfall, and in particular, focusing on East Africa. I'm then going to move on and talk about some recent events over East Africa, talk about some of the intranual variability, and I'll talk about some of the recent trends. And then going to move on to talk about future projections and importantly how we communicate those future projections and how, how we do that in a way that really relates well to users um, and talk about climate change narratives um, and then i'm going to do a final part on talking about dry seasons so shifting the focus away from seasonal rainfall to problems when we don't have seasonal rainfall during those dry seasons um, so starting off with seasonal rainfall through tropics so this shows an animation of monthly rainfall um, across the globe and we can see that around the tropics, um, we have this tropical rain belt that sits sort of around the equator. And this moves north and south throughout the calendar year, um, following the maximum incoming solar radiation. So as we're currently in the end of spring, the rain band is moving north, goes up to over West Africa and over India, where it will reach its northern most extent during northern hemisphere summer. And then during the autumn, as we move from northern hemisphere summer to southern hemisphere summer, this rain band shifts back south again, and we got our main wet season over South America, Southern Africa, and parts of Australia. And so you can see in the animation that we've got this rain band shifting north and south throughout the year across the tropical regions. And this is really important for determining the pattern of season and cycle in different regions. So looking over West Africa and over India, you can see the rain band moves north as we move into Northern Hemisphere summer. It then sits there during the summer and then moves south again. And it's very dry throughout the rest of the year. So in these regions, we have a main wet season during the Northern Hemisphere summer, but then it's dry throughout the rest of the year. Conversely, moving to the Southern Hemisphere, we have the opposite pattern. The rain band moves south in boreal autumn. We have a main wet season over Southern Hemisphere summer. And then again, it's very dry for the rest of the year. Over equatorial regions, we see a sort of different pattern because here the rain band is sort of moving north and south and it's moving over these regions twice per year. So in some regions, like East Africa, we've got two wet seasons per year. Once as the rain band moves north and another as the rain band moves south. Over regions like um, Indonesia and the Philippines, you can see the rain band moves north and south, but it never really leaves the region. And it tends to be just generally wet in this region throughout much of the year. So. To get you into thinking a little bit more about this, we've got a Mentimeter quiz. So if you find phone or tablet or laptop, um, you can go to this link. I don't know if you started it yet, so that might work. Um, 
So what you'll be showing, I'll just quickly explain this, what you'll be showing is some seasonal cycles. They'll look like this. They will all go from January to December. They all just go to the course of the calendar year. And the y-axis shows the average rainfall. So this is the Northern Europe, just as an example. Um, so you can see the values on the y-axis show the amount of rainfall, and these go from January to December. So you can see that for this region, it's dry in sort of April, May, and wet throughout the rest of the year. So this is what you'll be showing. So, okay. Okay. Excellent. There's lots of people there already. Okay. Nineteen. Right, I'll stop. So it will show you these seasonal cycles. For the first one, there are two, and there's a list of four options um, um, of the different places, and you need to pick which pair of places those seasonal cycles are for. So let's go. And I've switched off the time thing, so you've got the full amount of time. So we've got two seasonal cycles. Um, as you can see, they're very similar. Where do we reckon they're for? And you've got a minute. Okay, so most people got that correct. So we've got in these regions, we've got the main wet season in the middle of the calendar year, in the middle of northern hemisphere summer, rain clouds move north, and we've got the main wet season over West Africa and India. So next one. So here again, two seasonal cycles, we're given four options. Um, what are that for? Okay, so, oh, excellent. Yeah, so for these ones, we have the opposite seasonal cycle. We had a dry season during the middle of the calendar year. We have the main wet season over the end of the year. So during Northern Hemisphere summer, we have the main wet season um, during Southern Hemisphere summer, and then the two Southern Hemisphere locations, South Africa and South America. So three this time is just one seasonal cycle um, and a list of four different locations. So this one looks a bit different. 
50k. In fact, most people got that right. The key for that one was on the looking at the balance on the y-axis, but we see that actually throughout most months of the year, it was very wet. Um, so even though it looked like we've got this seasonal cycle, actually in the months when we looked at the y-axis, we're quite similar, and I'll come back to that uh, afterwards. So last one, and again, I will add as a hint, that the y-axis on this one is quite key. Okay, so it was split between Ethiopia and Sahara Desert, most of you saw, but even though it looks like we've got one peak per year, actually when we look at the balance, that one peak um, is very, very low. Uh, so it's actually sort of a very dry region. So, so this um, map shows sort of across the tropics and each color is a different seasonal categorization. So as we saw in those, um, in the Mentimeter quiz across West Africa and across India and China, we've got one wet season per year in the Northern Hemisphere summer. And this was this seasonal cycle and this seasonal cycle. So it was one peak in the, during the Northern Hemisphere summer. So yellow is regions where we've got one wet season per year. And again, we see across the Southern Hemisphere, we've also again got regions with one wet season per year. But this one wet season per year is shifted. This occurs sort of during Southern Hemisphere summer over the end of the calendar year. We see the same in Australia. Coming then to the red regions, these regions are regions where we said, well, it's dry year round, they don't really have a wet season. And this is regions like the Sahara, where you see the sort of the peak in the rainfall is less than one millimetre per day. So we have really small rainfall totals. Hence, these regions are defined as dry year round. We've then got dark blue regions, and these are regions we've defined as wet year round, where we look at sort of regions like Indonesia, where it looks like we've got these relatively drier months during the early part of the year. But then we see, well, actually, these drier months still have average rainfall rates of greater than five millimetres a day. So compared to sort of West Africa and India, these months would still appear in the top half of this plot. So generally, in this region, we don't really have dry months. It's just sort of wet year round. We see the same over parts of um, northwest South America. Again, here, it looks like we've got these two wet seasons per year. But when we look again at the y-axis, we see that actually most of the months have more than four millimetres per day. So in general, it's just wet year round. So there's a fourth colour in this plot as well, this bright blue colour that we see in very few regions. And this is regions where we've got two wet seasons per year. So moving on to look at East Africa in a bit more detail, the region in red is the region we're looking at, um, in comprising parts of Kenya, Ethiopia and Somalia. And over this region, we've got these two wet seasons per year. And when we look at the values, we see that the, the dry seasons are dry in this region. Um, so these are known locally as the long rains and the short rains. The long rains occur in March, April, May. The short rains occur in October, November, December. And they're separated by these two dry seasons. And when we go back to our seasonal animation of rainfall, we can see that it sort of makes sense. As the rain band moves north in the first half of the year, we get this wet season and then it moves past. And then as it moves south again, we get this second wet season on the south of the retreat. So in January and February, most of the rainfall is over southern Africa, we've got some over Tanzania, and it's dry over East Africa. In March, April, May, the rain bands move north, we've got the first season. Moving into the summer, the rain bands move further north, we've got more rain up over Ethiopia um, and over West Africa and the Sahel, but dry conditions over East Africa. And then as we move back into um, the autumn, the rain band moves south, and we get the second season. 
So this means that for a lot of the regions we talked about, for West Africa, for India, East Africa, parts of South America, a lot of their annual rainfall falls within just a few months. You have a few months where you have all of your annual rainfall, and then you have a long dry season. And then there are a lot of challenges around that and a lot of impacts around that. And I'm just going to discuss a few of these now. So starting off with hydropower, across the tropics and particularly in East Africa, hydropower is a really important source of electricity supply. So this pie chart shows the breakdown um, of energy installed capacity um, over Kenya in 2018. And the grey sector is fossil fuels, so we can see that's a significant part. The orange is geothermal, again a significant part. But this dark blue is hydro, showing that hydropower is really important for Kenyan electricity supply um, and for increasing energy access. And we see the plans for the changing installed capacity out to 2030. There's a massive increase in installed capacity um, to improve energy access over Kenya. And we see that this blue section is a significant part of that, indicating that hydropower is going to have a really important role to play, both currently in the Kenyan power mix and in the future. And this map on the right shows the location of population in Kenya. So those are showing the sort of dark brown colours, showing that most of Kenya's population lives in this um, southwest part of Kenya. And it also shows the location of different power um, stations. So in Kenya, there's a generally quite a limited grid network. So the areas of supply need to be close to the areas of demand. So we see that we've got some wind farms down here and one up here in Takana. We've got some geothermal stations here. And all of these blue dots here are hydro parks and hydropower stations. We've got some more here on the shores of Lake Victoria. So we see that these are really important for power supply and they're really close to population centres, which is really important. However, hydropower is obviously clearly impacted by seasonal rainfall. So this was a study done for the Mazinga Dam um, and the location of the Mazinga Reservoir and Dam as shown here, located in sort of central southern Kenya. Um, and this plot shows the correlation between rainfall and river flow. And this is kind of what we'd expect. When we get more rain, we get higher river flows. When we get less rain, we get less river flows. It's as we'd expect. But we also have this really strong seasonal cycle in river flow. But the river flow is higher during the wet seasons and lower during the dry seasons. So we've got these peaks in river flow during the wet seasons and lower during the dry seasons. Well, that's fine. But we don't actually want a seasonal cycle in electricity generation. We want consistent electricity generation throughout the year, and that's really important. Um, so this is a real challenge for energy planners in Kenya. How do they make sure dams are at a high enough level at the end of the wet season to make sure they've got enough water to go see all the way through the dry season to the next wet season? How do they make sure dam levels are right? How do they make sure manage river levels downstream so they've got enough water in the river downstream while also managing dam levels and considering sort of ecology and electricity generation. And this is a really big challenge of having all of your rainfall in a few months and then long dry seasons. And this was a particular challenge in 2020. At the end of 2019 and beginning of 2020, there was two very wet, wet seasons over Kenya above average rainfall. And actually quite a lot of the dams in Kenya reached record levels. So this is the Turkwell Dam in Kenya. This is August 2020, and you can see that it's reached record high levels and it's really quite close to the top of the dam. Um, a few months earlier, in April 2020, this is another dam in Kenya in a similar region. And you can see that this did go over the top and this is the water spilling um, over the top of the dam because that sort of careful management, there was so much water in the rivers at that time that we ended up with dams overflowing and therefore more flooding downstream. So this is one challenge of seasonal rainfall. Another is around health. So seasonal rainfall is really linked to health, and in particular, the life cycle of malaria and mosquitoes. So during wet seasons, we have heavy rainfall. We end up with things like puddles and in large lake areas, and this provides areas of standing water. And these areas of standing water are really important for the life cycle of the malaria mosquito, and in particular, for laying of eggs and for larvae development. And so therefore, during the dry season, when we don't have these puddles in the same way, we get much lower incidences of malaria mosquitoes and therefore fewer cases of malaria. So this study on the left um, was for two regions in Western Kenya, um, this region and this region, and they looked at parasite prevalence during the rainy season and during the dry season for a number of different age groups. And what they saw is that across the age groups, you had higher parasite prevalence, so more mosquitoes and more malaria mosquitoes 
during the rainy season than during the dry season. And this also creates challenges if you have most of your malaria cases, therefore, in a few months of the year. The second study on the right is for this is actually for eastern Ethiopia, and so therefore we've got a different seasonal cycle. We've got this main wet season in the middle of the year. Um, and this again then looks at malaria cases in these nine eastern dis districts of Ethiopia. And we can see that in generally, in general, the malaria cases peak either early in the wet season or just after the wet season, when we've got these areas of stagnant water. So seasonal rainfall gives us a strong seasonal cycle in hydropower, but also gives us a strong seasonal cycle in malaria cases. It also obviously has a really big impact on agriculture. Agriculture is the largest contributor to Kenya's GDP. It's really important across the region, both for employment and also for subsistence. There are a number of subsistence farmers who require, depends on agriculture, um, both for nutrition and for their food and for their, for their lifestyles. There's also a fairly high reliance on rain for agriculture. There's not the money or the utility for irrigation systems, and therefore there's really high reliance on rain for agriculture and for rainfall for crop water requirement. And therefore, the seasonal cycle of rainfall is again really important. And this image shows the crop calendar for Kenya. So this is different crops that are grown in Kenya throughout the year and looks at when they're planted, when they're growing, and when they're harvested. And you can see that all of these crops are either associated with the long rains or the short rains. So you've got a number of crops that are associated with short rains. These are planted early during the short rains, grow throughout the short rains and then are harvested afterwards. And we've got a number of other crops that are planted early in the long rains, use long rains rainfall to grow, and then are harvested soon afterwards. And therefore the timing of wet seasons is really important, and particularly around considerations around planting date. And there's a lot of questions at the moment around how can we offer good planting date advisory linked in with sort of forecasts of when the rainfall is likely to onset. If we're forecasting a later onset, should they plant later? If they're forecasting an early onset, should they plant earlier? How can they plant at the best time to get the most out of the rainfall season, to get the most rainfall into their crops and to give better crop yields? And there's a lot of challenges around this, particularly around if people plant early and then the rains come late, because your seed is then in the soil, you paid for your seed, it's in the soil. If there's not enough rainfall, it's not going to grow. And then maybe you need to plant again. But then you need the resources for a second of the seed. And therefore, there's a really strong alliance between agriculture, between planting and seasonal rainfall, particularly in regions like East Africa, where the rainfall seasons are quite short. You've only just got a long enough season to grow some of these crops. And therefore, the timing and the timing planting day is really important. And this plot um, was taken for a study um, looking at a county in Kenya and shows maize yields from different years and the annual rainfall in blue. And this shows that in years where we've got lower annual rainfall, we've also had lower maize yields. Again, showing the importance of seasonal rainfall on agriculture. So, summarising the first bit, um, looked at seasonal rainfall over the tropics, we've seen that a lot of regions have a really strong seasonal cycle. Most of the rainfall comes within a few months, um, and this has impacts on agriculture, on health, and on energy. So, moving on to look at some recent trends and recent events and variability. So this shows a timeline of the major agricultural production shocks in Kenya. Um, and we can see that there are quite a few periods um, when we've had lower agricultural production in Kenya. And this is annotated to show what events led to these lower agricultural production. So we see that we've got a few droughts events that led to lower agricultural production. Then moving on to floods. So too little rainfall and too much rainfall is both a problem for agriculture and then we've had some other impacts as well, erratic rains and floods in 2000 and droughts in 2011. So you can see there's a lot of variability and a lot of this variability is related to variations in the weather. There is others, um, for example, following the elections in 2007, but a lot of this is related um, to variability in the weather. So starting off with 97 to 98. So this time series shows short rains rainfall over East Africa um, from the 1980s and through to 2030. And we can see quite clearly that 1997 was a very, very wet year. This plot on the right shows the rainfall anomaly. So how much rainfall did they have in that year compared to how much they'd have sort of over the long term mean? And again, 1997 stands out quite a lot. And the bottom plot show the rainfall anomaly for each of the months. So this is for October, 
November and December. And again, we're seeing wet conditions across the region. This isn't just a small part of Kenya that's being affected by these wet conditions. This is across the region in all three months. And the figure on the right is taken from Relief Web and shows areas of maize losses, but it also shows this large pink region. And this is regions where we have large areas inaccessible, which is a real challenge for then getting aid efforts in, for rescuing people from these flood waters, um, and we're trying to help people on the ground when these large areas are inaccessible due to flooding. So what led to this event? Well, there's an oscillation between different sea surface temperature patterns in the Pacific Ocean called the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So this oscillation has two different phases, El Nino and La Nina. So in El Nino phases, we've got warm sea surface temperatures in the central and eastern Pacific. And in La Nina phases, we've got cool sea surface temperatures in the central and eastern Pacific. So these differences in sea surface temperatures then influence the circulation in the atmosphere above them. So in El Nino conditions, we've got more rainfall over the central and eastern Pacific. And then this changes the circulation over Indonesia and Northern Australia. In La Nina conditions, we have different patterns. We've got more rainfall over Indonesia and Northern Australia, and we've got different circulation patterns. And these different circulation patterns over the Pacific then feed on to different circulation patterns over the Indian Ocean and therefore impact East Africa. So we find that during El Nino phases, we get more short range rainfall over East Africa. During La Nina phases, we get less short range rainfall over East Africa. So this then shows the time series of index, and this index is designed to capture this behavior and capture these El Nino and La Nina events. Um, and so we can see that we've had few positive La El Nino events and negative La Nina events. And we can see this strong positive peak in 1997, which was associated with these short range floods um, over East Africa this year. Moving on to 2010 to 11, in this period we had droughts in East Africa. So these rainfall anomalies are now for seasons. So this is for autumn 2010, and this is for spring 2011. And we can see that in both of these seasons, in the short rains at the end of 2010, and the long rains at the beginning of 2011, we had very dry conditions over the region. And this therefore impacted two lots of agriculture production. We had the agriculture from the short rains in 2010, and the agriculture from the long rates in 2011. And this led to drought conditions over the region and significant food shortages. This news story is taken from the BBC in June 2011 and shows the um, crisis and emergency phases in terms of food shortages across the region. And this map in the bottom right shows vegetation quality um, in 2011. And so we see these brown colours indicating poor vegetation quality, which indicates sort of poor crop growth, um, and other factors, including vegetation and feeding livestock. And we see that this is generally quite poor across Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia, and into South Sudan. So whereas we saw on the previous slide that El Nino events were related to more short rains, when we've got a La Nina event, like we did at the end of 2010, this is related to less short rains, and this is related to the dry conditions we saw over East Africa at the end of 2010. Moving a bit closer to the present day, looking at 2019 to 2020, we had a lot of flooding in the region. And these books show the sort of heavy rainfall over East Africa. This is the normal expected average seasonal cycle. And this is the rainfall we saw at the end of 2019. So very wet conditions. And again, looking at this time series of short range rainfall, again, you see 2019 is very wet, not as wet as 97, but still very, very wet. The figure in the bottom left shows a figure from the European Commission, um, which is designed to sort of encapsulate some of the impacts of the East Africa floods. So the red dots show flooded regions. So you can see they're across Ethiopia, South Sudan, Kenya, and into Somalia. The boxes, which you don't have clearly, you can see, show the number of fatalities, the number of displaced people, the flooded farmland, um, and the killed livestock. And you can see, that we have high numbers of displaced people, over 200,000 displaced people from Somalia due to these flooding events. Um, and these flooding events then continued on into early 2020 as well. This also had impacts on lake levels. So just highlighting to you Lake Victoria, this is a really large tropical lake that sits at the border of Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania. And this shows lake levels from the early 1990s through to post the present day. 
And this large jump in Lake Victoria Lake levels at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, was due to these really wet conditions. And these two satellite images show the differences in the lake levels in this top corner of Lake Victoria just here. So this is May 2013, and we can see the Lake Victoria coastline. This is then May 2021, and we can see really big differences. If we look at sort of this island in the top panel, we can see it's almost sort of disappeared in the bottom panel. Again, if you look at sort of along this northern section, you can see that it's very different. And um, Kisumu, which is up here, is a really large city in Kenya. And again, we can see that the lake um, has sort of expanded into Kisumu and to these settlement areas along the southern part. And again, this had really big impacts. This flooded people's homes, people's livelihoods. It also had big, big impacts on Lake Victoria fisheries, which are an really important source of agriculture in the region. So not only did we have flooded farmland, livestock affected, we also had this increase in Lake Victoria levels, which then impacted shoreside communities and fisheries. Add into that as well, that this flooding encouraged good quality vegetation, it encouraged more vegetation growth, which then encouraged the locust outbreak that had happened earlier in the year, over the Arabian Peninsula to spread into East Africa. So this is again taken from the FAO. This is April 2020 and shows the swarms of locusts across East Africa, across Uganda, Kenya, Somalia, and up into Ethiopia. Um, and this image is taken from the BBC website um, in March 2020 and shows the swarms of locusts across East Africa. So not only do we have flooded farmland and reduced fisheries, any vegetation that was left was then decimated by these locusts. Taking you away from the perspective of East Africa for a second, this is March 2020. We all know what was going on in March 2020. This was the beginning of COVID. And therefore actually trying to deal with these locusts was even more of a challenge. Trying to get the pesticide to the right place, trying to get the flights up to then go and fly the pesticide over the regions was all really hampered by slower global trade and movement of goods because of the concerns around COVID-19. And therefore, this locust outbreak actually went on a lot longer um, because of efforts to hamper it or efforts to stop it were slightly hampered by COVID-19. So then moving up to the present day. So this is a news story on BBC News just a few days ago, um, talking about that since the beginning of 2020, we've actually had four consecutive drier than average seasons over East Africa. And this is again causing a number of challenges over the region. So this shows the food security update for Kenya at the moment and shows sort of acute food insecurity over parts of Kenya um, and malnutrition. So we see that we've got in East Africa, we've got this pattern of very strong tangible variability. We've got these drought events and we've got these flood events. On top of that, we've also got long-term trends. So now focusing on the long rains, which is the first of those two seasons in spring. So this was taken from a paper in 2015 um, and we see that from the mid 1980s through to the sort of late 2000s, we had this decline in long range rainfall. We can see the sort of interannual variability that we talked about, the drought events, the flood events, and average years as well. But overall, sort of imposed on that variability, we had this long term decrease. However, when we look at future projections, they suggest that actually in the future, in the long range, we might have a slight increase. And this has led to a lot of questions. Um, it's been termed the East African climate change paradox. And it's led to questions like, well, what's driven this recent decline? What sort of variability or forcing within the atmosphere has led to this recent decline? Is this going to continue? And then equally, for the future projections, well, are they reliable? Can we trust them? Are they capturing the right processes? What's leading to this increase that we currently see the decrease? And there's a lot of research recently that's gone into trying to understand this decrease in a bit more detail. So moving on to some work that we did to keep this decrease. This then shows March, April, May rainfall, average shows East Africa, and I've used three different data sets. Generally, when looking at African rainfall, we don't use gauges because there are very, very few gauges. The gauge records we have sort of fall in and out, um, and therefore they're not reliable. So we tend to use satellite-based rainfall data sets, and we tend to use a few to then sort of check them on showing similar things. So when we look at March, April, May rainfall over East Africa, we do see that from the early 1980s to the late 2000s, we had this decline. Since sort of 2010 to 11, it does suggest that there's been some recovery. This previous plot only actually went to sort of 2010. This does suggest that actually since 2010, there has been some recovery. 2018 in particular was a particularly wet year. 
So to look at this decline in more detail, we divided the period into three smaller periods. So we've got period one, which is this wetter period, period two, which is this drier period, and period three, which is this sort of partial recovery, high intranual variability periods. And then in these three separate periods, we've looked at the mean annual cycle. So this goes from February to mid-July, so over the peak of the long rains. And period two, which is this drier period, is shown in the blue line. And we see that actually, during period two, the rain started much later. We can see that this line increases much later than the other two lines. We've got this later start to the rains. And we've also got this earlier end. It starts to decrease a lot faster during period two than it did during period one and three. We actually don't see much difference in the peak rainfall, but we do this sort of see sort of this constricting of the season, this tightening, with a later start and an earlier end to the season. And we used a metric for looking at the onset and cessation of the season to see whether these patterns were widespread across the region or just in a few regions. So this panel here, panel C, shows the difference in the onset between period two and period one. And we see that the blue colours across the region indicate that across the region during period two, we have this later onset. Similarly, when we look at the end date, again, comparing period one and period two, we see these red colours across the region, indicating that again, across the region, we have this earlier end. So we see when we've got this decline in the long runs, we've got this short season. When we then compare period one and period three, we see much smaller differences. We don't see the same sort of consistent differences across the region. Again, showing this recovery in period three. There have been a lot of studies that have looked more at sort of what's driven this um, change in the length of the season. Studies that looked at sea surface temperatures in the Indian Ocean, looked at changes in the circulation patterns in the Indian Ocean, looked at changes in the winds coming from the Congo, because the Congo is a big source of moisture to East Africa, and also looked at changes over the Indian and Pacific Oceans more generally in how this is related to this decline. So that was the second part, looking at some recent events and recent trends. So moving on to look at future projections. So in order to produce future projections, we need climate models. Um, for those of you familiar with climate models, sorry, for those of you not familiar with climate models, I'll give a brief overview. And I would highly, highly recommend if you want to know more of these carbon brief articles, which is where these um, images are taken from. So how does a climate model work? Well, a climate model works when we take the physical principles that govern how air and water move within atmosphere and oceans, and we translate those physical principles into equations. And this, the only equations you will see in this presentation are here and we don't think about. We then turn those equations into computer code, um, and we run this computer code on a 3D grid. So we divide the atmosphere up into a number of boxes, both in space and in height, and in the oceans, in depth. Um, we solve these equations and we run this computer code on each grid box, and they then pass information um, to neighbouring grid boxes. We then run these models with different greenhouse gas emissions, both for the historical period and for future periods. We have these different scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions, and from this, we get historical and future projections from these final models. So, as I said, very brief overview. So, we used these climate models to look at changes in the wet seasons under future climate change. So this was done for a high emissions scenario, and this is done comparing a 20 year period at the end of the 21st century with a 20 year period at the end of the 20th century. So we're comparing sort of 2080 to 2099 to 1980 to 1999. So looking at changes over a 100 year period. Um, and I should say that the dots here indicate where the climate models agree on the change. So in this work, we used about 29 climate models where the models are all saying, yes, it's going to get earlier, or yes, it's going to get later, or wetter or drier, there's dots. If there aren't dots, it means that the climate models, some climate models are saying earlier, some are saying later, some are saying no change. So in regions where we don't have dots, we don't have much confidence in predictions. In regions where we do, we have more confidence in predictions. So that we see that the long rains, we don't have large changes, and we don't have much confidence in predictions. We might see the end of the long rains get earlier, which is the red colour, but actually we don't see many consistent changes. The short rains, however, we see the start get later, we see the end get later, and we see a large increase in rainfall during the short rains. In addition to changes in rainfall amount and timing, 
Um, we've also looked at changing rainfall intensity. And these two graphs at the top show the rain per rainy day. So how on, a, on an individual rainy day, how much rain do we get? And we see in both seasons, even though we don't see cha many changes in long-range rainfall, we do see increases um, in the rainfall intensity. Um, and a number of studies have looked at this in more detail. So some recent studies have used very high resolution models with very small red box spacing. Um, these models tend to have a better representation of tropical rainfall. And these models suggest an even greater increase in high intensity rainfall. This plot shows the fractional change in different rain rates. And we see these higher rain rates in the red model, which is the very high resolution, we see an even greater increase in rain rates. So we're seeing this increase in rainfall intensity. But so coming back to our future projections, we've seen we've got this later short rains and more rainfall during the short rains. So we wanted to look at this in a little bit more detail. So we ended up coming back to our animation of seasonal rainfall, and we see that the short rains occurs, we to put to come again, um, between the end of the West African monsoon and the onset of the main wet season over Southern Africa. It's during the southward retreat of the rain band during the second half of the year. We get the end of the West African monsoon, short rains, and the onset of the main wet season over Southern Africa. So this just summarizes this a bit more. We've got the end of the wet season over West Africa, and the onset of the season over Southern Africa, between the two, we get the short rains. So then we'll have the question of, well, what's the projection for the end of the West Africa monsoon? What's the projection for the onset of the main wet season over Southern Africa? And again, we use the same approach with the same 29 climate models. And we see that the end of the West Africa monsoon is projected to get data, and the onset of the main wet season over Southern Africa is also projected to get data. So this suggests that this sort of southward retreat of the tropical rain band during the second half of the year, the whole thing is projected to get slightly later. We've got this later end of the West Africa monsoon, later short rains, and later onset over Southern Africa. So we then used a metric which sort of averages to a tropical rain belt position over Africa throughout the year. So we see that the seasonal cycle we expect, we see the tropical rain belt moves north in the first half of the year and south during the second half of the year. So the green line is the sort of present day seasonal cycle that moves north and then it moves south again. The red and the blue lines are these sort of future projection of the tropical rain belt. And we see that during the first half of the year, the lines pretty much all sit on top of each other. We're not expecting many changes. During the second half of the year, however, we see that the lines don't sit on top of each other. These red and these blue lines are sort of shifted north of the green line, or equally sort of shifted later than the green line. So we see again, we've got this later retreat in the southward, um, southward progression of this rain band, consistent with our later West African monsoon and later short rains. And this just shows the difference between the red and the blue lines here and the green line here. And we can see really clearly that from sort of July, August onwards, um, through to the end of the year, we've got this northward shift, which is this delayed southward retreat um, of the tropical rain band. So moving back to our projections, we saw that we've got quite a good agreement for the short range. We've explained why. We've explained that it's related to this southward retreat of the rain band. In general, we've got less good agreement for the long range. There's also questions around the performance of Chaka Monsu. So there's a lot of uncertainty here. And there's real questions around well, how do we communicate this? So in terms of climate model performance, I've talked about climate models. Climate models do very well in some regions and not so well in others. So this shows, again, as we've seen, seasonal cycle over East Africa. This is from observations. This is from the previous generation of climate models. And we see that they're not doing a great job. Um, the short rains are far too wet, they're wetter than the long rains, and they just don't have the correct seasonal cycle. This is the latest generation of climate models. This is the ones produced around the time of the last assessment report. Um, this seasonal cycle confusingly goes from July to June. So this is then the short rains and the long rains. And we see that the models are still overestimating the short rains. Now, this doesn't mean they can't be used to produce future projections, but it does mean we have some questions around the reliability of projections. So then we end up with big questions. Well, we've got uncertainty in the projections. We've then also got uncertainty in the models. How do we communicate this? Um, and a lot of this work was done as part of the High Crystal Project. And this is taken from the sort of goals of the High Crystal Project. The aims were to look at African climate variability, look at climate change, 
But this part in dark blue, one of the aims was to work with regional decision makers to support effective long term decision making in the face of a changing climate. So, communicating climate change to these decision makers was really important. Giving them information on climate that they could use to make the right decisions was really important. And a lot of climate change communication comes around, but we'll give you some visualizations and you can apply it to your sector. You can work out um, how this applies to you. And so in this project, we worked on climate narratives. And the aim of these is to help address these challenges. The aim is to translate the climate data into like coherent stories of future climate to try and communicate this better. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this process. So these were the very early versions. So we've got different changes in temperature, it's gonna get hotter. We've got changes in intensity, increasing intensity. We've got changes in amount, and this is sort of where our uncertainty comes in. We've got these sort of drier and wetter, it might get going either way. Um, and we've talked about more variability. And then it sort of translates through to impacts of um, how it will change flash flooding, um, how it might change upland crops, such as coffee, when we've got more light times. Also included in this, we have this sort of two page technical summary. You've seen this plot before about changes in rainfall intensity. We have changes in onset sensation, changes in Lake Victoria levels. And this was discussed with users at an initial meeting and wasn't overly well received. It was well received, but there was some negative feedback, particularly, I'm going to say, around the box plot on changes in onset sensation. This was not like a box plot was not seen as good science communication. I quite like it. I think it captures the uncertainty quite well. The users did not. Um, so we then ended up with this new approach after several iterations with users. And the way we've covered the uncertainty is with these three different climate futures. So we talk about these three different climate futures as all equally plausible, coherent storylines of future climate over East Africa. So we've got these three futures, one being much wetter, we saw the increase in the short rains, and a large increase in extremes and hotter. We've got the second future as well, which shows an increase in extreme rainfall and hotter, and this future three, um, which was much hotter and drier uh, with more erratic rainy season. And this then covers the range of projections we've seen from our climate models. It doesn't maybe not fully cover the range, but it does see, cover the range of projections from climate models. And then we can talk about the impacts around these different futures. So this is what was produced for rural communities showing um, climate change impacts at the top and adaptation options at the bottom. And for each impact, the colored dot indicates, well, is this likely under future one? Is this likely under future two? Is this likely under future three? So we see some of them are likely under all three futures. Changing nutrition levels with resulting health impacts, actually we might see that under all three futures. Some of them are just down to two, sort of changes in um, crop growth. So sort of talking about well, actually, maybe a different range of fusion vegetables can be grown. Maybe we can start to grow perennial crops um, because we've got more rainfall, but that's only under futures one and two. Other um, impacts are maybe only under future three. Impacts around migration and rural communities seeking alternative livelihoods. And the idea is that the users in rural communities can then look at this, look at the range of impacts and say, well, under what futures should I plan for this? Sort of things like where we've got all three futures, yes, whatever happens, we're likely to have that impact, whereas some of the other impacts are maybe less likely under different futures. We also did the same for urban environments, again, thinking about different climate impacts now, so we're talking about urban rather than a rural setting, and here we've talked about different intensities of impacts, so low, medium, and high. So again, we've got um, different impacts, or we've got some impacts that are under all three, Drainage systems being overwhelmed and hard to maintain, or maybe that's because we've got more rainfall and that we need bigger drainage systems. Maybe that's because we've got drier seasons, the drainage systems pull up with rubbish, and therefore when we do have more extreme rainfall, better all gets, we all have problems because the drainage systems get full. Or equally, if your soils are hard due to dry conditions, the rainfall doesn't filter in, we get more rainfall coming through drainage systems. So that's an impact we might expect under all three. Um, however, there are other ones that we might expect under one teacher. Increases in respiratory diseases, allergies and dust, that might be more likely under a dry future than a wetter future. Conversely, increases in water diseases, well that might be more under a hotter and hotter, wetter future. So these were um, spread out to users across the project and were generally sort of quite well received as a way of communicating climate change impacts. 
to those users specifically. So that was talking about future projections and narratives, what might we expect in the future, and how do we communicate that to users in a way they can understand and identify with. So just the final part on dry seasons. So under future climate change, we're expecting large increases in precipitation intensity, and we're expecting that to increase at quite a fast rate. However, there are other constraints within the atmosphere that mean that mean precipitation won't increase at the same rate as intensity. We'll have a larger increase in intensity than we do in mean rainfall. And in order to balance these two things, we therefore have to have more dry days and longer dry spells. And this is something we've seen in quite a few studies. So this um, plot at the bottom shows the change in the number of dry days under future climate and shows that we expect this increase in the number of dry days over Central America, and South America, Southern Africa, and parts of Australia. And a lot of studies have looked at changing in dry spell lengths, how we expect maybe longer dry spells under future climate change. So this again shows, this is taken from the IPCC Atlas, um, and shows again that we expect longer dry spells over Central America, South America, and Southern Africa. However, as we've seen, a lot of regions across the tropics have a really strong seasonal cycle. They've got a very marked wet season and a very marked dry season. And a lot of these studies have looked on an annual basis. But actually, when we're talking about impacts on agriculture, when your dry spell occurs is really important. If you get a really long dry spell in the middle of the wet season, that's not going to do crops any good. If you get a really long dry spell during the dry season, well, actually, that only impacts things that are growing during the dry season, which may mean perennial crops are more impacted, but actually may mean crops during the wet season are less impacted. So the aim of this work was to look at changes in wet and dry spells and to split it into wet seasons and dry seasons separately in order to get a better idea of the impact on agriculture. And this schematic just summarizes some of the things we found. And so we found looking at dry seasons that we found this less rainfall during the dry season and longer dry spells in the dry season over quite large areas of South America and Southern Africa. Actually, over East Africa and parts of the Sahel, we saw more rainfall during the dry season and shorter dry spells in the dry season, suggesting a sort of wetting of the dry season in that region. Over South America, we also saw larger increases in mean maximum dry season temperatures. So in South America, over the dry season, we've got this picture of less rainfall, longer dry spells and hotter temperatures. For the wet season, we didn't actually see much change in dry spell lengths, which is fairly good news for agriculture grown solely during the wet season. We did see shorter wet spells in the wet season in some regions, but in general, we didn't see these longer dry spells occurring during the wet season. And then all this has differential impacts on agriculture, as I've already sort of alluded to. Crops grown solely during the wet season may not be impacted in the same way. Crops that have to survive the dry season, perennial crops and forest crops, such as things like cocoa and coffee, that have to survive through the dry season, they may, make, they may be impacted more by drier dry seasons in the future, particularly with longer dry spells. And so, yeah, just to summarize that bit, and the huge projections, we're expecting these longer dry spells, but these are likely to occur mostly um, during the dry seasons. So, just thought I'd end with that animation and see if I have any questions. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Oh, um, I just thank you. It was a great talk. Um, I just had a quick question about how much warning we get from these drought and flooding events um, at the moment. Obviously, you're looking into it from my time to the future, but in the next you know, couple of years, we get we only get warning from these events, aren't we? That's a great question. So there's been a lot of work done around forecasting and around seasonal forecasting at the moment. So particularly over East Africa, you've got the two seasons. The short rains are really strongly linked with things like El Nino. And therefore, because we can predict El Nino and other roads variability a few months in advance, we can actually do quite good predictions for short rains. So a few months out, in East Africa, they have this um, regional meeting and it happens three times a year. And they have this regional meeting where the regional center releases the seasonal forecast and they talk to the different impacts and sectors that's going on at the moment back to the summer season over Ethiopia um, and they talk to the different sectors and they say this is the seasonal forecast this is how your sector should prepare um, and then there are updates to those seasonal forecasts released throughout the season 
Now, for short reigns, the skill of those forecasts is really good. For a long reigns, the skill of those forecasts is not so good. So, for example, for this year, um, the forecast that came from the regional centre suggested around an average season, and actually what we've seen for the last few days of the long range at the moment is actually a below average season. So, yes, there's a lot of work being done around forecasting, around trying to help prepare people. And actually, one of the projects I didn't talk about that I was done last year was trying to work with users again to produce forecast products that they wanted. So, we were talking to farmers in Ghana about well, what you want to know. And they said, well, we want to know the rainfall for the next three weeks. Because if we're going to plow, we need some rainfall before we plow so that the ground is softer, and then some rainfall after we've plowed. But we need to hire the plowing equipment, so we need to book that in advance. So we need the forecast information and um, for how to do that. So, yes, there is forecast information, it's a different skill, and particularly for short rains, it's quite good, but maybe more limited for other regions and other types. Yeah, we'll go ahead. Hey, I have a question about that. I was just wondering. How clear is the mechanism which is driving like, the delayed perceptive migration? Um, so, delayed perceptive migration. So, we looked at this um, in a bit more detail. So, the, you've got this um, heat lay which sits over um, West Africa during the summer. Um, and this is a sort of really important for circulation. And what we found is that in the future, this heat low circulation gets stronger. So, you have a stronger heat low, which is keeps the rain band north for longer. And what we suggested was that we see this increase in the heat load index in the future. So we created this index of heat load and we found an increase in strength. And so therefore what we proposed was that you've got this increase in the strength of the heat load, the rain band stays north for longer, and then you've got this delayed southward retreat. So in order to test this, um, well, we tried to test this, we looked across our models and we looked in each model at the change in the heat load strength and the change in the tropical rain band position. And what we found was that models that had a larger increase in heat load strength had a larger change in rain band position, and models that had a smaller change in heat load strength had a smaller change um, in rain band position, which suggests that this may be one of the drivers. Um, other studies have looked at this at a more global scale, so we've looked at the tropical rain band around the whole tropics. And again, they've sort of found this delayed south of the tree and linked this to sort of changes in energy and, and changes in temperature and all the kind of things. So this is sort of on a local scale. There are any sort of more bigger energetic arguments that are sort of global scale. This talk was really great. I really like the animation. And I was wondering how you go about building sort of resilient solutions that essentially would work regardless of what the yeah, no, I think I think that's a really big challenge. And I think I think this is where sort of the question around seasonal forecasting comes back into this as well about thinking about adaptation options that sort of spread across um, and not necessarily thinking about a wet or a dry future, but sort of how do we plan for both and how can we implement sort of interventions and things that sort of we can scale up at a seasonal landscape. So sort of I'm not an agriculturalist, but thinking about crops and thinking about actually, well, when we see the seasonal forecast, we go actually this year we're going to plant a drought resistant variety that may have a lower yield, but it's more reliable. Actually, this year expecting weather conditions, let's plant this variety, which will give us higher yield, but it's more high risk. Um, and I think sort of thinking about resilience is very often thinking about sort of having communities that are sort of flexible um, to deal with these conditions. So that can't, can be difficult and you sort of require a lot of resources maybe um, to do that. But I think. Particularly in the regions like East Africa, where it's so uncertain, those sorts of options. And so sort of when things are being built, think about well, what happens if it's wetter or what happens if it's drier, um, and trying to plan for those options. That's a very interesting Okay, cool. Let's go. Um, so, regarding your communication project, um, I'm sorry, I might have missed it, but who was aimed at? Like uh, general public, policymakers? So it was designed mostly at sort of um, policymakers and NGOs. Yeah. So in the project, we had these sort of three sections of the project. There was the climate science part, there was a rural part that was working with rural livelihoods, doing some household survey, trying to understand, break down the household income and how these different parts would be impacted by climate change. So that work. That was sort of how that work was done. That's how we got the feedback of what impact we're going to face um, from that side of it. So yeah, mostly working with sort of NGOs and, and from the urban. Then it was talking to sort of urban town planners and people working on the urban town 
project was a lot of looking around some sort of sanitation and drainage systems in cities. So they looked at sort of two cities in East Africa and the sort of maps sort of drainage and sanitation systems. And then we're looking at sort of well, how might climate change impact those. So again, around that sort of to form the sort of town planners and, and city planners in those regions. Was it difficult in terms of culture differences or language barriers? How, how did you deal with that? I so, mean, as you're in rural areas, not everyone. Yeah, so I think there's there's always a lot of stages um, sort of between, um, so it's, I was very much on the climate science side then. I think some of the people on the particular urban side um, have done a lot of work previously. One of the people in the urban project previously worked for, I can't remember which organisation, but working on sanitation for something like the UN, so had a lot of sort of links in that area, it's very familiar with talk of that. Um, the, the way the household surveys work is done in rural areas, it's sort of, it's very often sort of locals are trained in doing a household survey work, which is then collected back. But you're right, it's a really important consideration. It's, we just can't really just do a survey and go, you know, what kind of change information do you want? Um, it's a sort of a really important sort of feedback process of going through the stages. And so when sort of forecast information is disseminated to farmers, for example, it's very often sent to agriculture extension workers who will then go out and disseminate to farmers. So there's sort of Quite a few steps and people in between so we're used to sort of communicating in one direction and in the other direction. There's a question on the state that are three different features. Yeah, how did you get around to track the resonance? Is it that the different models would predict different futures or is it the scenarios uh, depending on which scenario? So there were considerations around scenario and there were considerations around model projections and I was involved in this part, but some of the other sort of climate scientists on our part sort of looked at the range of model projections and sort of looked at well, some of the models were showing wetter, but you'll note that actually all three say hotter. Sort of none of the models were showing colder, so we didn't include that because it was like, well, this is this isn't expected. Um, I think all of them again as well mentioned more extreme than anything because again that's not something we're quite certain on. So we looked at these sort of different aspects um, of the climate change and thought, well, which ones are we certain on? And we'll go into all three futures, which ones are we less certain on, which is generally going to be mapped. Um, and sort of came up with the three. And the idea was that they would be different, they talk about different impacts and they sort of cover the range. We could, I think, I don't know why three was decided on, yeah. to be honest. Um, I guess to cover a range of uncertainty without being unmanageable. Yeah. Um, but I don't know sort of what would you say there are sort of equal provided to the So they within the narratives work, they don't give any assessment of probability of the shift in futures. Possibly if you looked at the models, maybe one future would be more likely than the other. But in terms of the idea of having the three to sort of communicate the uncertainty without saying, well, actually this one's more likely. But if you say, well, this one's more likely, one's going to go, oh, I'll just do that one. Yeah. Um, so this is it's so interesting. Some of the challenges around thinking about, because I might go, well, actually, I think one of these is, you know, I would think one of these is more likely. But actually, in terms of a communication perspective, getting people to think across the screen, um, I think it's sort of quite good that they say, actually, we're not going to, we've got these three, all three are plausible within the range of the models, hence we don't have colder or less intense rainfall, um, but actually they've not ascribed sort of weighting for anything. Uh, which was the least available? Right? Yeah, I did that. These are on the high crystal, actually, that's the back. Yeah, if you go to the High Crystal FCFA website and look at the kind of narratives, they are there. And with so sort of with each narrative, there's these are the last versions, there's the sort of this part, and then there's the sort of two-page document that sort of describes them in a little bit more detail as well. Thank you. Anyone that can get across? I have probably a silly question. if the seasons are short and short, is there any so this is a really interesting question. Um, yes, and actually a lot of the projections, I don't have a slide on that, um, a lot of the projections show an increase in January, February rainfall. So we've got the sort of the short rains and then the long rains, and we've got this January, February. And a lot of the projections show an increase in this January, February rains. So if you go from sort of a short rains to then a sort of semi-wet, semi-dry season, and then into the long rains. And actually that's some of the work I'm doing at the moment is to go, nobody's looked at the January, February season, it's going to be dry. So what's going on with the future projections? What's drying in January, February at the moment? And what is projection showing? Because yes, it is 
I think it is more like if we've got you know changes in the movement, we're going to have change in the change of the seasonal cycle. Um, so that's some of the work I'm doing at the moment, actually, is to sort of go, you know, are the models doing anything reliable? What drives January, February at the moment? Um, and sort of what's going on with that. And I think some of that's kind of the interesting question as well around crop growth and things like that. It's actually got a wetter season, can we then grow more crops that sort of extend across the two? Um, but then equally, do we then have a longer dry season from the end of the long run instead of the short run? So, yeah, I think it's entirely possible. And I think it's sort of some of the interesting questions around things that we've seen last year rather than just things in not too ready. Man, is that a question on the chat or no, was that? Oh, okay, brilliant. Oh, okay, that's it. Uh, I don't think there's any questions, so I think we'll wrap up there. Uh, thank you very much. That's the whole oh. time. Yeah, yeah, please go. Oh, in fact, sorry. Um, it's just about like on the graph when it said about like what's kind of affecting that crop today, so it's about like commodity price shocks. So I was just like wondering how much in East Africa is export based or domestic, and then how how much sort of different kind of impacts like the uh, mental oscillation like in different regions affects the price of those, the, the, the crops grown in East Africa and like whether there's alternatives that would be so effective. That is a great question, um, to which I don't definitely know, don't know with the answers to all the parts of that. Sorry. Um, I know there's a lot of exports because I know a lot of the exports come here. So things like the cut flower business in Kenya um, does a lot of supplying um, to the UK. Um, I don't know about sort of um, changes in crop, crop prices. I do know that a couple of years ago, beginning of 2020, there were changes in the prices of tomatoes. But that was only because they were looking for somebody to go to the climate change aspect of it. So I ended up talking about tomatoes and <laughs> changes in climate. Um, so around the sort of other questions, I, I think it's an interesting question, um, but I will really answer to that. Any last ones? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a glass tip. I was just wondering how much synthetic fertilizer is used in agriculture. Uh, I don't know. Again, a lot of it is subsistence farming. Um, so I imagine maybe not that much. Um, but then I don't know much about sort of rural economies. Um, and I feel like every project I do, I learn a bit more. I didn't know that far, the farming equipment was hired until I was talking to. Farmers who wanted to know when best to hire it. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't know. Uh, I was just wondering, like, to what extent do you think running models that are like convecting the table and the solution is like the solution? So, that is an interesting question. So, that was actually something that was done as part of this same project was that these convection policing simulations, very high resolution simulations, were run. They were found to have a better representation of climate in the regions and this increase in intensity. They were also very, very expensive to run um, and costly in terms of well, in terms of carbon and in terms of money um, and in terms of computing resources and things like this. So they did have a very good representation and they did inform us more about sort of changes in intensity um, and things like that. Um, I think it's really interesting thinking about the climate change time scale, but also thinking about the shorter time scale and actually running models like that on a shorter time scale, where we can say, actually, does this give us a more reliable forecast for the next weeks and months um, is another interesting question. Another question around sort of the application of those models to sort of provide information. Um, so the simulations that were done were sort of done for 10 year present day, 10 year future and compare the two. Um, so I think that's sort of, I mean, maybe doing another scenario in mid century would have been quite interesting as well. But so, yeah, I think they're value definitely improved representation, but actually, maybe on a shorter time scale, they'd be more useful in providing more specific information. Amazing. Uh, I think we'll close up there. Thank you very much. That's amazing. Um, yeah, perfect for our first, our first, our first seminar with intensive intensive uh, systems. We showed how the season rain causes really does influence everything from an energy help people and then obviously how adaptation and mitigation and the efforts when we try to deal with climate change to sort of interact with that we can sort of do it a little, a little more efficiently in the future. So yeah fine thank you to uh Karen and then we'll end it there.